Welcome back to episode 165 of the Disorganized Wizard Club podcast. My name is Alex. I'm joined as always by Cam. Hey, hello. And just Cam this week. We're a pair of Ottawa-based players that play just about any, anything and everything we can qualify for. We talk about decks, tournament stories, just about anything to help you and ourselves get better at magic. Not just us. Not just us. This week we've got our friend, friend of the show, multiple-time guest, actually. Yeah, and he's been here a few times. Currently tied for the Pioneer Trophy lead on MTGO. Matt Hemsley, a.k.a. Hemsley on Moto. How you doing, Matt? Hey, thanks for having me back. Yeah, it's glad What's to up? have you back. You can crash on our podcast couch anytime. <laughs> That's, I'll, I'll take you up on that, you know. Maybe I'll start getting some, like, crazy, like, reactionist views and just, like, need a platform to spew them, and, you know, I'll call you guys up. Yeah, I mean, I might regret my offer of hospitality, but, uh, you know, still got to offer, right? Yeah. That's what friends do. And, I mean, speaking of yeah. crashing and on couches... It's funny enough, when we got in that huge car accident on our way to Toronto, we were actually going to Hemsley's place to stay with him. Oh, yeah, you almost that cursed show. us. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that was pretty wild. You know, mm-hmm. just waiting for you guys to get there. I had all the stuff set up, and then, oh, uh, you know, we just got in this massive, uh, you know, 20 car pileup, so we're not coming. Yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, Matt's girlfriend, Sammy, ensured me that all the alcohol she bought for us will be waiting for us next time we're there. So that's a know. good deal. <laughs> that's, yeah. We got a knife. We'll have to find our way back down there at some point. Yeah, maybe we'll take the train. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's, no cars this time. Well Adam, well, Adam and Brad are coming this weekend to see another band, eh? So, like, yeah, we'll that's right. Left. That's why Adam's not here right now because there's a string of hot water music shows between oh, I see. Uh, Montreal and Toronto. So, yeah, because he said he was going to Montreal tonight, and I didn't know yeah. why he would go there Wednesday evening. But mm-hmm. yeah, so he's gone. But. We've got Matt in his place and we've got a lot to talk about. And this is actually the perfect week to get Matt on the show because this weekend is the first two players tours of the year, both being Pioneer, uh, Brussels and Nagoya. And then the weekend after is Pioneer which act- in Phoenix, which actually Matt is qualified for. And I'll be going along with our friend LP because we're going to play in the Grand Prix while Matt plays in the players tour. So Matt and I have been playing a crap ton of Pioneer. We've got a lot to talk about and we're going to just talk all about Pioneer this episode. I've been paying no attention to Pioneer, so uh, just I'll be along flavor for the commentary. Ride. Yeah. I'll be along for the ride. I'll ask some questions. <laughs> well, it's going to be good. So I guess let's start, start a little bit with uh, your testing, Matt. How's your testing been going for Pioneer? Uh, it's been going pretty good. Um, the format's obviously like very new, and this is the first you know major tournament really mm-hmm. coming into this uh, PT this weekend. So uh, interested to see what kind of breaks out. Um, the field's pretty wide open though. So, yeah, I mean, we were, our intention for this episode is kind of to go through the top tier decks in the format and it, it, there's actually a lot more than you would have thought. And the format, like you said, is pretty wide open. There's a lot of very playable decks. And like you said, we haven't actually had a large scale pioneer tournament yet. I mean, I don't really count the SCG invitational from the end of last year, in that category because it was a split format mm. tournament. So we don't get the same kind of information. So, so, well, so it was not only was it a split format, but that, you know, there's been like a whole lot of bannings like since that happened, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, so much Oco's has changed. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this is the longest, like everything. going into this weekend, this is the longest stretch we've had since Pioneer started with zero bans. You know, the format hasn't changed in a long time since, uh, what was the last banning, Oko? Oko, okay, yeah, Oko okay was the last one. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of like exploration. We just got a new set, the Heroes Beyond Death. So there's new archetypes popping up, new strategies have evolved. So, you know, really anything could happen. I'm really excited to see what happens this weekend because we are really are sort of wide open. So as kind of a general question then about your experience testing, Matt, uh, this list of decks we're going to talk about is quite long, longer than usually the tier one list of a format is. Uh, do you feel that because the format is so new and there hasn't been these big tournaments and maybe not as much time put into testing yet that a lot of these will fall away when the format gets put through the ringer or playing against these, do they all seem to have enough power to hang around and we actually just have a diverse format? Yeah, I mean, that's like a really complicated question because like... That's why yeah, I asked you. This, this about, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> there's, about, there's about like 15 decks that I think are like pretty reasonable to take into tournament which is like pretty wild Mm -hmm. um when you think about it that's like huge and it's not just like 30 or like 15 playable decks or whatever it's like 13 or 14 decks i think are like actually poised to like reasonably take down 
uh, the tournament. So, yeah. you know, it, it's obviously like huge, but you know, a lot of these decks, um, how do you, how, how do I say it? It just, I think if anything, like the list of decks could like get longer, if anything, I think there's a bunch of these decks that are sort of here and like kind of clinging to tier one, like barely. And there's a lot of decks that are just barely outside of tier one that are missing just like a couple pieces. Mm. Right. We were talking a little bit before about like how like a burn strategy, you know, is really just missing a two drop to really be good. Mm -hmm. Um, And you see the formats kind of like shaped around that with decks like Niv to Light that can never beat like, you know, 10 lightning bolts in their life, you know, Uh, you know, existing and flourishing and like kind of being able to next level all these like mid range decks just because they're allowed to exist because there's not really like a good aggro deck in the format that doesn't just like fold to Supreme Verdict. Mm-hmm. right so it's 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 tough to say i think there's a lot of decks in here that are like kind of half there um spirits being one of them where i think that like half the deck is like really good and then the other half of the deck is just kind of filler yeah that has to be there because like missing some pieces so decks like that might get like exposed a little bit but you know they also like high roll enough you know where they draw like multiple spell colors that they might just like stick around until they, they find the pieces they're missing. in yeah. light of that so, then as a follow-up question does having a field of viable decks this wide change how you approach deck selection or brewing or building? Like, cause in a lot of formats you want to pick something that you think has good matchups against the two to three tier one. And you sort of have a sideboard in mind for those decks. But if the field is this diverse, do you, I mean, I think I would lean towards something more linear. I would sort of give up on trying to have a plan for all of them. Absolutely. So that that's exactly what it is. And I think that just in general, in Pioneer, the threats are just so much better than the answers, which has been kind of discussed about like a lot, you know, since the format's kind of creation is that it's really good to be doing something proactive. So that just like on the, like a power level side, you know, it's better to be playing threats and ans- than answers, but then also on the deck kind of like diversity side, you know, it's like going to be hard to like answer all this stuff. Mm-hmm. So just being able to like care more about what you're doing and then interact a little bit on, you know, their side of the table to like kind of slow them down a little bit, but ultimately be more concerned about what you've got going on and you can see that kind of reflected in a lot of the decks here that are like you know considered good and even like the blue white control deck that's supposed to be you know responding to the field is built with like you know seven or eight like planeswalkers and plays more almost like a super friends deck than like kind of a draw go control style that we're more used to yeah selective of the fact that it's like much easier to be proactive in this format than than reactive for a number of reasons sweet yeah, and I mean, we'll get into your the deck you've been working on in a bit. How much value do you put into, you know, finding something that's kind of not on anybody's radar in a format like this? Because there are a lot of playable decks, but I mean, I guess we'll we'll spoil it already, but you've been working on Kethis for a while, which is not really a deck that we've seen put up many results and, you know, the challenges or hasn't really been on anyone's radar. It's kind of just been floating around. I think people played it a little bit back when we had Oath of Nyssa in the format, but we haven't really seen much of it since. And now, now that we're going into these players tours, do you think choosing a deck like this gives you a considerable advantage on the field? I guess there's definitely like a lot of equity in like, you know, your deck not really being known, like your opponents are going to make like kind of mistakes. Mm-hmm. or whatever from like a purely like um, technical point of view like assuming that your opponents like don't make mistakes because they're inexperienced in the matchup uh, i'm not entirely sure that kevis in itself is something that gains like a ton of advantage from being kind of unknown the issue being that like you kind of fold to graveyard hate a lot of the time yeah and like that's going to be packing graveyard hate for you know a variety of other decks but so i think like most of the equity to begin there is like you know, the inexperience, not quite sure, like, what matters. Uh, I've seen that, like, a lot in, like, playing people in, like, leagues where they, like, tank a long time on a decision and, like, choose, like, not the optimal, you know, target because, you know, they're just, like, not super experienced. Yeah. It's not like you're playing, playing against Kethis, you know, every single league you play. Yeah, so when I was actually, like, playing scales for the first time, that really got drilled into me, right? Like, the, the benefit of, like, playing a strategy that people, like, kind of think they know what's going on, but, like, not exactly, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Because, like, in the first like month of playing like scales before it got like, you know, really big and people kind of realized like, Oh, you know, what's going on. People just like tap out like against like lethal, like on board to play like a tireless tracker. And you just got like, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they're going to spend four minutes to make a clue and then I'm going to make a 40, 40 ballista. <laughs> you know, you're, you're dead. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Here is that, you know, you gain so much advantage of like playing against like a known quantity. And even though like deck lists are open, you know, it's a lot, it, it more affects the decision-making process, I guess, than the actual, 
For sure. All right. So let's uh, let's hop into some uh, into our list here, and we'll go through deck by deck, give some thoughts on each archetype. We'll kick things off with the one deck that has been relatively consistent near the top of the format since I mean since the format started with mono black aggro. Did eat a ban in uh, Smuggler's Copter, but the deck's still putting up lots of results. Very powerful. The package of Thoughtseize, Fatal Push, and one mana black creatures. It's going to get a lot of people dead. What are your thoughts on this deck, Matt, and how it, it sits right now? And it's hard to argue that this isn't like the best deck in the format. You know, it's just been putting up results through multiple like bannings. Like the only thing it's taken away, got taken away from it was, was the Copter, right? Whereas a lot mm-hmm. of other decks have had like multiple, you know, cards stripped yeah. since the format's inception. But this one, you know, it's just, yep, cheap, efficient removal. You know, the best removal is all in black in this format. So you're playing, you know, your fatal pushes, you know, you can... Uh, you know, Swift End is like huge, obviously. After that, you can kind of like play around with it. You know, you can do like the Grasp of Darkness. You can do Cast Down or Hero's Downfall or whatever. Drag to um, the Underworld's a new one. I've been seeing the decks play as well. Yeah, that one's pretty good too. Mm-hmm. Just like too many instant kill everything usually. You know, you, you know the threat base is, is great. You know, Wrangle's really strong. You know, you've got these, you know, one mana recurrable, you know, threats. You know, it's, it's weird that this deck doesn't get like more respect. It, it gets like a great deal of respect, but like, it, you know, seems in a vacuum, to, like it seems to have the tools the and be built to do exactly what we said Pioneer requests. Like, it is a proactive plan. Obviously, it's an aggro deck. But it's also, like, its cards can pivot and be incredibly flexible against this wide field. Like, Rankle has good modes against any strategy. Uh, Murderous Rider has modes that are fine against any strategy because it's a removal spell or just a creature. Thoughts he's obviously good everywhere, like... Its cards are flexible enough, and it's proactive that, yeah, it makes sense this is doing well. Murderous Riders, like a creature and a removal spell, is just so important, right? Because, like, you know, you see that in, like, the Chonky Red deck a lot, too, right? Where, like, with, like, the, the, the Giant, as well as, like, Glory Bringers, having your removal stabled onto creatures is, like, really so big in this format. Because it's right, you, you can't, you almost can't have too many uh, answers, right? Because, like, people are just, like, being so proactive, right? So yeah, having that card just be great at both is, is obviously Nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, like the biggest that I think the biggest advantage this deck has on the field is there's not very many good one mana spells in Pioneer. And this deck gets to play probably two of the best ones, I would say, in Fatal Push and Thoughtseize. And they just play perfectly with the main game plan. All your other one drops, like Knight of the Ebon Legion, is probably top three, maybe even the best one mana creature in the format depending on how you look at it. You get to play Mutavault, which might just be one of the best cards in the entire format as well. Get four Castle Lockthwain, which is the best out of all the castles. So you have all these really hard-hitting, powerful, cheap spells. All your threats return, keep coming back, and you really put your opponents under the gun and get under, I mean, a lot, a lot of decks in the format that we're going to talk about. Just really don't have a chance of racing this and fighting through all the cheap interaction this deck puts forth. Uh, I think that's a great point, is that you just you get to play something good on one every turn, or every game, rather, mm-hmm. right? Like, you got, so, like, you, you, it's just, you know, Thoughtseize, like, whatever, but then just, like, one of your, it can be up to, like, 12, somewhere between 8 and 12, like, one mana, or whatever, you know? Because, like, you know, Knight is, you know, a threat, I would say, so. Yeah. Yeah, and just, like, think about it for a sec. Think about every single color in the format, and think about the good one mana spells. What do you have in red? Like, shock. Yeah, you have like <laughs> shock, swift fear, swift fear, wild slash. Uh, okay, think about green. You have land of elves, yeah. elvish mystic, uh, blue. What do you have? Opt. 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 <laughs> okay. Mm, Siren storm tamer. Okay, white. Uh, well, there's Thraven a bunch Inspector. Of like, Thraven Inspector. Thraven Inspector is nuts. That's it. Okay. There's like uh, well, white one drops for like weenie decks and such. Yeah, but think about how good they are. Now I'm going to list off black Thoughtseize. Yeah, okay. Fatal Push. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Knight yeah, of the Ebon black. Legion. Like, do you see a little bit of an imbalance here with these one mana spells? <laughs> I mean, blue is like a little different because like most of the blue decks, with the exception of like Spirits, who has like Mausoleum Wanderer, which is actually mm-hmm. very, very good in that strategy. It yeah. like definitely rivals like Knight, you know, for sure in terms of like one drop starts and aggressive decks but like i don't know like opt is really good with like uh dig and whatever it has the best right like it's not even close right mm-hmm. but like it also feels like despite being like a monocolored deck and you kind of get this with like a lot of other decks i guess like monocolored but like most 
with this mono black deck is that you don't really feel like you're sacrificing anything because I have my removal, I have my you know great threats, I've got my disruption, you know I've got sideboard options like yeah. uh, Kalidas and you know Harvester and you know direct you know what I mean like it's just yeah. you have all your bases covered like being in the one color right so like there's not really holes in the mono black deck which is what makes it so strong to play into like an open field. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, we can't even sell short the power of just being a monocolor deck. Your mana base, everything is untapped always. Your mana is generally always perfect. Uh, you don't have a painful mana base, which gives you an edge if you're racing. This deck, it just has a lot going for it. It's going to keep winning tournaments. And I mean, it should be on your radar if you're going into a Pioneer tournament and then you're not playing this deck, you should expect to face it and have I mean, a, you a plan. Graveyard. You even have graveyard options, right? And like mm -hmm. Leyline, uh, Leyline, and more recently, like Erebos's intervention has been pretty good. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, if you you pick any problem in the Pioneer format, I mean, Mono Black Aggro pretty much has a way to fight it in some way or another. Which you know you can't really say for a lot of a lot of decks. I'd say in the format. No, this this one's hole proof. So if you're looking for a deck that's like pretty much like gonna have a reasonable matchup against like the whole field you know kind of like that jund vibe this is a deck you should definitely reach for yeah uh, the power level's there um doesn't have very many bad matchups you know you can cover a lot of your bases through creative sideboarding this one's yeah this one's just really solid if i, if I wasn't playing Kathis, i would probably be playing mono black makes sense to me <laughs> next one next one on the list uh this is an interesting deck so we have chonky red which was I would say probably the best deck in the format a little while ago, but things have changed a little bit since, and we've seen some decks kind of surge into popularity, which really put a beating on Chonky Red, but now it's evolved again, and we saw it, it won the Showcase Challenge on Moto this past weekend, this new version of the deck by uh, Alice1986 that foregoed the Glory Bringers and played a lot more low-to-the-ground version of the deck, adding Monastery Swiss Fear and Abbot of, Car of Carol Keep and going for the full four Torbran in the main deck. Is this even chonky all... anymore? There's no five drops. <laughs> it's still chonky. Ed. Look, well, read the title. Yeah, okay, I can read the see title, the title, but... <laughs> well, you know, we came up with what? We call it Diet Chonky, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Diet Red. That's, uh, it's, yeah. a little, it's a little thinner, you know? It still goes over the top of some stuff, but, you know, it's, uh, it's got to turn down. That's true. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, this, uh, this deck originally was taking, basically, you had your cheap interaction with your stomps from your Bone Crusher Giant, uh, Wild Slash Lightning Strike for your early game, and then you really leaned on your three, four, and five mana plays like um, Goblin Rabble Master, Chandra, Torch of Defiance, and Glorybringer to really close out a lot of your games because those cards were just absolutely powerhouses in many matchups. Now especially on Moto with how popular Niv to Light has gotten. Niv to Light kind of rose to really prey on this type of deck. A lot of those cards are just absolutely horrible in the face of the Niv Mizza decks. And because all of your power in the original Chonky Red decks were kind of all in your three to five mana plays, you couldn't effectively get under the Niv Mizza decks. And I mean, you're not, you're not winning uh, a long game against the five color Niv Mizzet deck. Mm -hmm. They're oh, gonna not. you know no. <laughs> they're just gonna absolutely bury you in card advantage. And I mean they have answers for, you know, absolutely everything across five colors, right? And how are you ever beating a six six dragon in the air? Your you can't even bring, exert on it. Yeah, your glory bringer doesn't yeah. do anything anymore. Right? Yeah, no, it's it's dragon relevant creature mm -hmm. type for sure. That's so I mean everything you said is like very true. I think you just kind of like hit the nail right on the head there. Just from maybe like a slightly more like abstract point of view, I was so high on this deck for so long when the format changed, right? When like Oko got banned and this deck, you know, started putting up some five O's. Like I hopped on it pretty quickly and thought that this was great because it sort of like epitomizes exactly what we were saying before about, you know, you want to be playing threats more than answers. And if you are playing answers, they have to do more than one thing for you, right? So you see that, of course, in Glorybringer, you see that in Bone Crusher Giant. Yeah. You see that in Wild Slack and Lightning Strike. Um, you still get the monocolored mana base. It's this and like mono black are really the kind of like two decks you can kind of classify as like like the no bad card decks, right? Where you're yeah. just like playing over cost and like or under cost and stuff at like every point in the curve, and just like every threat you have can kind of just like win the game on its own. Like a Rabble Master obviously can just like win by itself. Yeah. Um Glorybringer obviously is like great, right? But then 
you know, once people sort of adapted to that sort of style, it like shot up right in popularity, like really quickly. Right. Cause like a lot of that was like prompted by like people like Todd Anderson and like Corey Bowmeister, you know, giving it like a platform. Yeah. I think one right, of the, the <laughs> one of the streams I did earlier in the month, I was playing chunky red, at least every single league, one league, it was like three times in a row, yeah. you know, lots of people were playing it. Right. So it just, I don't know. It just did what the format's supposed to be doing on like a fundamental level, like so well. And it was popular because like, you know, people like personalities were playing it, you know, mm. it kind of just like shot up there and it kind of got exposed like a little bit. You're right. with like the Niv to light decks, but I also think like the mono green and like ramp decks, like the mono green stompy deck was like really tough. Cause like, how does this ever be like a five, five on turn two? Yeah. I mean, they play you know? Galta and all of a sudden you just cannot yeah. ever win in a million years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of stuff that just like can't answer. So unlike the mono black deck, that does have answers for everything. Mono red in this format while having a lot of like really great stuff like Rabble Master and like Glory Brain and Torbrand doesn't have answers for everything, which is kind of when this deck gets exposed to like a little bit. Yeah. Um, it answers like, like the more recent like version of it that just like won this, this uh, like the showcase, I think answers like a lot of those questions really nicely by trimming, going lower to the ground. Yeah, you're kind of ignoring yeah. the, you're just trying to get under those threats that you can't beat anymore by playing your uh, more one drops, more two drops, and just trying to close the game out before those problems become relevant, right? Uh, unclear how that how that helps so much against like mono green, like the Stompy, but against like things like Ramp and like Niv, you're just like trying to go under them. Yeah. And I think that's like really important. And I also don't think that the Stompy deck is like going to show up to the Pro Tour, no. quite frankly. It's, yeah. Uh, no, nah, I mean, like, that deck's like fine, right? But it's <laughs> like, if it just feels like when you play that, you're punching your way to like 3-2, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. But we also saw another version of the mono red deck. Well, put up a pretty good result at uh, Magic Fest New Jersey this past weekend in a PTQ. And a lot of people have been talking about this. This deck goes even yeah. harder in the aggressive uh, area of the game. We're back to four Muta Vaults, but we, ha we have Hazret back in the deck. We're playing Rimrock Knight in the two drop slot, as well as um, the new Theros card, Phoenix of Ash. And I mean, this deck is aggressive. Yeah, it's got Rimrock Knights. It doesn't know how to block. <laughs> no, it's uh, it's definitely cool. Like, so when I started playing Pioneer back in like uh, like October, November, I started with like the Burn deck, and I did pretty well with it. But like the the, the, the big problem with like Burn and Pioneer is that you don't have a good two drop, mm -hmm. right? And there are a bunch of like patches you can try to you know play like Fashino Pyromancer, like Eidolon's not really great. The format's like a little too big for like the, the like the, the trigger to matter so much, but also it like is a complete nombo with like experimental frenzy in the board. So that's not like ideal. There's just there isn't really a great two drop for like like the burn type strategy. Mm -hmm. Right. Rimrock Knight's like okay. Um yeah, but I think this deck is like great because it's like it's positioned just super nicely because people are taking advantage of the fact like they're playing decks like Nib Delight that can't beat, you know, 20 mountains and like <laughs> 40, you know, lightning bolts in a million yeah. years. You know what I mean? Yeah. So like it, it, Rimrock Knight's not great, but people are kind of exploiting the fact that this deck doesn't really exist. So if you can have a functional two drop like this that, you know, does actually work quite nicely with all these prowess creatures that you're playing. I don't know if this version we're looking at is playing like the Abbot. Uh, this one's not um, playing Abbot. We have four Swift Spear and four Soul Scar Mage, as well as four Bomat Couriers as one drops. Okay. Um, well, but I love the Abbot. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I would play the Abbot in this, at least like two copies, but like. Mm -hmm. I well, I mean, know. we were we were talking about this deck briefly on the pre-show, and when we look at a deck like this, you automatically draw comparisons to the mono red prowess deck from Modern. But the main difference is in Modern, you have you know a critical mass of very good one mana cheap burn spells that really allow you to take full advantage of your cheap prowess creatures. Yeah. We just don't Not have, even one mana. yeah, sometimes zero even mana, right? zero mana, right? And we just don't have. Yeah those in this format so you don't get the full power of your one mana prowess creatures that often and rimrock knight fills this really weird hole in the deck where it's a two mana three one you're pretty shit for luck for good two drops but a two mana three one is still fine stats if you're looking to be aggressive but you know the boulder rush side of this card the one mana instant kind of just gives you more one mana spells to take it full advantage of these uh, aggressive prowess creatures. So it's actually like hilarious that this seemingly bad, you know, 
red creature is actually just incredibly good in this strategy. You guys aren't even talking about the absolutely sweet and busted synergy it has with Hazaret. <laughs> you can have functionally like three or four cards in hand, but yeah. still attack with your Hazaret because all your Rimrock Knights are on adventure. <laughs> you're, True. You're definitely right <laughs> there, yeah. Yeah. That is good. Yeah, this one's pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. I can see this one like taking off, having like a good weekend, uh, yeah. quite frankly. Yeah, I mean, I, I like that you have multiple mana sinks in your late game between Phoenix of Ash on Escape and also your Hazarets plus just Ramunap Ruins and Mutavault. So like, even if you're flooding out, you're going to just always have something to do with your mana, which is another thing that, I mean, Chonky Red had going for it as well. But I think this version of the deck just has that much more to spend their mana on, which I really like. So you're never really running out of gas with a deck like this, which is very interesting. And for, so we yeah. were just praising the flexibility of mono black and to a lesser extent mono red to like have answers for pretty much everything. I don't think they had main deck answers for Hazard. I guess there was two Grasp of Darkness, but like Hazard is the type of card that if people forget about it briefly, they could just forget to like have correct removal for it and it'll just smack people. Yeah, and funny cool. enough, a lot of the mono black decks I've seen being played have moved away from, you know, three copies of Grass of Darkness and now play a split between that and Drag to the Underworld, which is way worse against Hazard, of course. So, uh, I mean, the only thing that most of these decks have is like Rankle, I guess, but that's not... Yeah, the, the odds you're killing a Hazard with a Rankle are not very high. <laughs> What are you going to do? Make them discard a card? I guess they draw. Well, no, you can just make them discard cards for their hazard. That's nice. Yeah. <laughs> How kind. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think it's funny because like hazard went away, but it went away from being played early in the format, mostly because of Oko, right? Because it's like empirically unplayable in the yeah. face of Oko. There's a, there were right? a lot of cards so, that were empirically unplayable in the face of Oko. So. Well, it's another reason why like Burn was never good it's like oka was there and then oka went away but it was still like ah you know you still don't really have a two drop doesn't really solve a lot of the problems but you do get hazard back which is pretty huge game especially mm -hmm. if rimrock knights turn out to be uh serviceable yeah yeah i'm i'm honestly i i'm on the lookout for a good performance from a deck like this this weekend i think you you get under most of the decks in the format and like we were like i was talking to you have so many so much power in the late game even if if we even get there you know, if your early game aggressiveness doesn't just close things out. I think this deck is a very, very good choice if you're playing a Pioneer tournament. I hope this one stays hidden because Kethis would have a terrible matchup. Holy moly. <laughs> uh, I think the uh, cat's out of the bag on this one, unfortunately. But we'll see. Let's keep on the, the monocolor deck train here and move on to Mono White Devotion that I think a lot of people have been trying very, very hard to make something like this work, obviously with uh, Heliod Sad Crowned and Walking Ballista take advantage of the full combo there. We've seen, you know, low to the ground aggressive decks. We've seen bigger, you know, Nykthos trying to Nyx decks. Uh, this version we're looking at is uh, Shota Yasuoka's deck from the most recent Pioneer Challenge on Moto. It looks like he's got, you know, Thraben Inspector and Offensa Kintree Spirit, which plays well with your Blusta plan. Daxos, Blessed by the Sun, Knight of the White Orchid. You know, he's playing for full four Arcanist Owls to, you know, search out your enchantments like Stasis Snare, uh, your Heliods, and, you know, another new addition from Theros Beyond Death, Elspeth Conquers Death. Which, Arcanist Owl gets Ballista too, right? Yeah, it searches uh, artifacts or enchantments. Thing. Yep. Wow, it just gets every part of your combo. Yeah, finds everything you'd want it to and turns on Heliod on its own. So Dude, that card is insane in this yeah, deck. A very nice pickup for this deck. But, you know, Elspeth Conquer's Death is a card that has really exploded in popularity in Standard recently. And now we're starting to see it in uh, Pioneer as well. And it's a really powerful, you know, option for a deck like this. You know, cleanly answers uh, a lot of threats on your opponent's side gets back a, a walking ballista that maybe died earlier in the game, you know, maybe could protect you on a turn that you're trying to go off on a combo when you're, you have a, you're on your chapter two. There's a lot of power in this general shell here. Honestly, I don't even know if this is the most optimal, optimal build of a, a deck like this. I know, 
another deck from the top eight of this event was playing Collective Company, playing Green White, um, that that kind yeah. of strategy there with uh, Militia Buglers. You know, maybe that's the a better option to go if you're trying to play, you know, a white Heliod Ballista deck. But I don't know. What do you what do you think about this deck, Hamsley? Well, yeah, I actually didn't really think about. Sorry, the Collective Company deck. That's pretty funny, right? Because like. You can't get Ballista off of the Coco, but you can get Militia Bugler, which can then go find yeah, Ballista exactly. off the Coco, which is like a fun little interact. Yeah, okay. That's pretty good. Um, I do like this whitelist, though. I think it's like pretty good, and you're right. It's like very underexplored. Although we pretty much, this is like a called shot for like you and me, Snelly, right? Because like as soon as, you know, Healer got spoiled, we were like talking back and forth about like how a deck like scales, and even the decks like Coco decks, you know, it's hard for them to play the combo right because like it's not really good enough for Heliod to just be you know a combo piece right like it has to yeah. be like practically like other elements of your game so we kind of decided like pretty early on that you want like a mono white shell and we had like both mono white like kind of a white weenies version of it which is probably not great because it's like pretty mana intensive but then also like a mid-range white yeah right and like you talked about it on the show too i think um yeah it did yeah my, I think- my early versions of the deck were definitely a lot more aggressively slanted but uh right. The decks that we've seen putting up, you know, five O's and actually doing well in tournaments have been these more, you know, bigger white decks with, uh, you know, Thraven and Spectre. We've seen some with Avacyn, maybe some more Angels in the package. So, like, when I was building this, like, myself, just, like, when Healer got spoiled, I think I, I missed Anafenza being, like, busted in it because that card is, like, very good with this deck. Just, mm-hmm. like, putting the extra counter on it can really trim the mana requirements. Um, plus, it's, like, great with the Nikos. Yeah. But... Uh, yeah, we pretty much had this. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that. and you know, I've I've played against versions of this deck a lot online, and I kind of thought Daxos would be a little underwhelming when I first read it, but it's actually very, very oh. good in this deck. Dude, it's nuts. I've seen that thing be a, like a two fifteen, mm-hmm. like like literally, yeah. like fifteen top. It's actually absurd. Like it's crazy. And yeah, obviously, just like anything, like ETB gives a life. Okay, you know, ETB gives a counter too with with Heliod or whatever card's really good um mono white also has like pretty flexible tools for like answering stuff it's like removal is like pretty lackluster because like you have to kind of go with like things like stasis snare i guess yeah and, like, i mean maybe, like, this deck specifically board. just has stasis snare elspeth conquers death and then walking ballista i guess and those are really your options so i mean you're not you don't have your the pick of you know the best removal in the format by any means oh. but it's a little clunky, but it all does like play into the devotion, which is, I suppose, nice. I've seen like quarantine field being like pretty crazy with Nixos. I don't know if that's good or not, but like, yeah, yeah, I, ha- I have run into that card a couple times now, which is definitely a sweet card. That card was super fun and standard as yeah. well. Yeah. But I, I kind of like the look of the the company deck a lot, and then collected company is not really a card that we've seen do anything in Pioneer. And I think if we had gone back to when Pioneer announced, a lot of people would have told you that they expected great things from Collected Company in this format, and that just hasn't really been the case at all. Uh, there's not really, like, a combo that you can, like, assemble with Collected Company, like you see in, like, other Eternal formats, like Modern, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, like, in Standard, it was good enough just to be, like, part of, like, the, like, the creature aggro stuff, right? But, like, the power level, I guess, is, like, threats in this format is just like high enough that you know the stuff that you can kind of get with collective company isn't you know lights out i guess you know what yeah. i mean like, there's also kind of the aspect so you mentioned earlier matt that the spirits deck felt like it was half a good deck and half filler that had it had to play because it was missing pieces yeah. and that this is kind of symptomatic of other decks and other strategies in the format is that they feel like they're these gaps that they're just playing subpar cards because they have they need something they need 60 cards but things are missing exactly. And you can't yeah. really risk casting company in a deck like that because if your four mana instant hits filler cards, yeah. you're going to get just surpassed by whatever your opponent's doing. Yeah, that's true. That's that's absolutely true. It's also why I think you don't, like that and the mana is like why you don't even see it in like the spirits deck, you know what I mean? Like I'd say like, the, like sometimes people play blue-white spirits in modern without Coco, right? But I think those people are crazy, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you don't, like, you don't see people do that yeah. too often. Well, yeah, no, Cam makes a like, just fantastic point, right? Because, like, you know, Coco is, like, what holds the, the Spirits deck in Modern, like, together, right? Just being able to get, you know, a couple of these cards at, like, instant speed or whatever. Yeah. 
but uh, here you don't see anybody playing with it. And again, of course, like part of it's going to be the mana, but like part of it's also just like half the cards you don't even want. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because the power of company is, I mean, well, first and, and foremost, how lucky creature. you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, but then yeah. it's the rest of the it's the creatures in your deck. Like it's not doing anything. Like can you imagine collecting? Can you imagine collecting company and then like putting two spectral sailors into play? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean uh, collected company is great when you get two three drops but i mean anything less than that you're generally not the best trade-off and i mean the games you whiff are just i can't i i don't know many worse feelings <laughs> playing magic uh, than whiffing on a collective whiffing. company <laughs> yeah you wouldn't whiff in that deck though very often right you're playing like actually like 36 creatures and this i guess this like takes into that right you play like 32 mm-hmm. but like that's like four or five more than like you need to like actually play collected company. And yeah, yeah, you're you're all in on uh, collected company. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, it's four or five more than you need, but ballista doesn't count. So true. Yeah. Oh, so essentially yeah, so twenty eight. Yeah, yeah. But white devotion decks are something to definitely keep an eye on because I mean, two card combos existing are always. I mean, they generally always tend to end up being busted at some point. Even if they another. just sleep in the format until like a shell crops in that can support it well and then mm-hmm. they start taking over. Yeah. Honestly, like I've played with like the ballistic combo like a lot since because I'm playing it like in Kathis and I played against it a lot because it's like pretty flavor of the month. But like as far as two card combos go, I think that especially that can sort of go at instant speed because you can give like the lifelink at any time. Yeah. Right. But like, you know, this one takes like nine mana to assemble and it can get broken up with like a single fatal push. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's definitely so, like, very, very fragile. Goes into setting it up, and like you have to like plan out like a lot of your turns. So it's like a two card combo, but it like takes more than like, you know, like a lot of the like, reason why Twin was so good was like it didn't really take any setup, right? Like you can have nothing on board, and then you pass the turn, and then for seven mana, like over two turns at instant speed, basically you can just like go off, right? Like, yeah. You just like flash in and then quit, right? Yeah. Um, but this one takes like a lot more setup. And honestly, I think as far as like two card combinations go, I think the inverter combo is like probably more potentially dangerous in the format. Oh, just because, we'll, like, this we'll one get is so there. Easy to yeah. Oh, well, yeah, absolutely. We'll get, we'll get there. there We're going to talk about that deck. I love that deck right now. <sighs> as far as two card combos go, this one seems pretty fair. Anyway, yeah, Before, we could skip to inverter, I guess. It's not like next on the list, but. All right. So let's jump into Demir Inverter of Truth combo. Now, this is a deck that has started to pop up a lot on Moto over the past couple of weeks. A lot of big names have been working on it. I know Canister has been working on this deck for a while, and he committed to play it at the in Brussels this weekend. And it's been putting up, you know, a five zero here and there. It top aided the showcase challenge, and I think uh, Canister missed top eight by one match, finished six two. You know, if anyone doesn't know the combo of this deck, I'll, I'll because it's you know relatively unknown still. Inverter of Truth is a four mana. Devoid Eldrazi costs black, black, and two for a 6 6 flyer. When Inverter of Truth enters the battlefield, exile all cards from your library face down, then shuffle all cards from your graveyard into your library. And this is essentially a combo to get rid of your entire deck, make it super small, and then win with Jace Wielder of Mysteries or Thassa's Oracle. And you can essentially sculpt your graveyard to make it very small or just not exist at all with cards like Dig Through Time, Murderous Cut that sort of thing. And then aside from that, you're just playing essentially blue-black control. This deck, I mean, it has its problems, but I mean, one of the things I really like about this combo is that it's actually just incredibly hard to interact with. I mean, there's a lot of spots where even if you kill the Thassa's Oracle, if there's just no cards in their library, they still win. There, you obviously, this deck plays four Fatal Push. It also plays two Thought Erasures. And there's a lot of turns where, you know, you cast your Inverter of Truth and your graveyard is just, you know, an opt and a couple discard spells. So you shuffle back, you know, two discard spells and an opt into your deck. And then you're inevitably going to draw one of them. And then you can check out what's going on in your opponent's hand so you can safely resolve, you know, your Thassa's Oracle or something like that. So it's... I think it's pretty scary, and I would put my money on this deck to have a very good breakout weekend at the PTs this weekend, and I wouldn't be surprised if it took down the whole thing. And, you know, it might actually, if it does as well as I think it, I think it's on, on a watch list because Watsy has shown 
disdain for two card combos in the format. And I mean, obviously you have to put some work into it, but the fact that it's just so weird and hard to interact with, I think puts a lot, you yeah, know, it's a power behind it. Stronger than like a two card combo. Like it's not like two card combos classically where both cards on the battlefield at the same time combo. It's one where you can play an inverter and if it resolves, it sets you up to play a Thassa's Oracle at any point in the next however many turns. So like the amount of flexibility and patience that it gives you in comboing is like, yeah, it makes it hard to interact with, makes it very weird. It's a strange setup. It's like a combo, like it is a combo, two cards going together, but they don't have to be on the field at the same time. No, no, exactly. Which is really strange because then how do you even fight it? You have to like counter all the inverters. Yeah, it's it's really awkward. Like obviously you can fight it with counter spells, but you know, like I was talking about earlier, the deck's playing a lot of discard and you know, if you resolve an inverter, chances are you're shuffling back one of your discard spells. So, you know, when I've been playing this deck, I mean, it's it's kind of easy mode. Like if the inverter if the inverter resolves, you know for sure you're going to be able to see your opponent's hand so you can know what's up and if it's safe to go for your oracle or go for your jace. So, it makes it really awkward to play against in that sense. Yeah. I would imagine that like the the control matchup is just like super interesting and like yeah. intricate on like both sides, right? Because like you could like if you like inverter and just like keep a Thassa, you know, like mm -hmm. they could just counter it and like win immediately. Yeah. So there there definitely is a right. lot of play in that matchup and it's super it's super fun for sure. I, but I do think the the inverter deck is slightly favored just from, you know, what I've seen watching the deck be played, from what I've heard talking to other players who've been working on the deck in my own play experience uh, uh i i think it's just like gonna be super complicated from both sides and like just like when do you pull the trigger you know what i mean yeah well i actually i, lo I love playing the matchup because it's actually really interesting and there's a lot of cool decisions and what what i've really liked about this deck it's i actually think i've had the most fun in pioneer playing this deck out of every deck i've played in the format it's super fun a lot of interesting decisions. And I, you know, I'm hyping the deck up a lot, but I mean, you do have weaknesses. There are still, you know, very aggressive decks that can definitely get under you. Just put a 6-6 six, six in the way. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but funny enough, you know, you play your Inverter of Truth and it's a 6-6 six, six flyer that just stonewalls pretty much everything in the format, which yeah. is, is kind of crazy. And, and, you know, one of the biggest downsides of this deck is that you're playing an allied color. You're playing blue-black, so your mana base is awful. I mean, you're playing four Fabled Passage just because they're fantastic with Dig Through Time, which is a really important part of your strategy. But, I mean, if you're looking at the, the lists now, I mean, Choked Estuary? Ugh. I just throw up in my mouth reading that card name. Like, it's that, that yeah. cycle of cards are so, so bad. It's pretty bad. I mean, I, you're playing like fed, fetid pools as well, which I mean, those aren't great either. They're like okay in this strategy because they also cycle. So, you know, you resolve your inverter and if you have, you know, a four or five card graveyard, you can get a uh, four or five card deck afterwards. You can get through it quicker to, you know, find your discard spells or find your Thassa's Oracle or whatever. Right. But yeah, the, the mana base is definitely the biggest weak point of it. And, you know, funny enough, bouncing back to the blue-white control matchup, you know, their Field of Ruins, if your opponent is smart with their Field of Ruins, awkwardly they can a lot of the time cut you off of black post-inverter post or cut you off black early enough that you can't really ever play one. So a lot of the decks have moved up on higher swamp counts now before you were playing like one or two. Now a lot of the decks are playing three to be able to fight that. So you're definitely the biggest weak part of this deck is its mana base. And I honestly don't know what the best, you know, iteration of the mana base is. I, I honestly can't bring myself to play Choked Estuary. I've just been playing Temples of Deceit <laughs> because, I mean, Choked Estuary is always going to be tapped anyway, so why not just scry with it, right? So, yeah, so yeah, that's probably better, honestly. Like, yeah. Yeah. Especially when I'm playing two. Mm -hmm. Just like really quickly, because like, I think you pretty much like nailed it. You've had a lot of experience with this one. Uh, but like, just look at the sideboard, like the one that we're looking at now with yeah. the exception of like mystical dispute and like i guess a one of scarab god you can just like play all these cards in like mono black you know what i mean like the yeah, sideboard is like all black yeah 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 and i mean you do have yeah like we we've been talking about we have 
all the you know best black cards essentially in this deck you have options with all your black sideboard cards you have some you get to play mystical dispute which is fantastic against a lot of the decks in the format you know funny enough i started with scarab god in the main deck and one in my sideboard and like have you guys ever resolved a scarab god versus mono black aggro you think they could beat that uh, card yeah. in a million years the answer is no they can't well, <laughs> the game yeah, just ends <laughs> Um, I mean, you are a little susceptible, I guess, to rankle, but yeah. I mean, yeah. There's there's things you lose to, but I mean, to take their rankles. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's true. But yeah, I I like this deck a lot, and I'm kind of bummed that the um, PT Nagoya and Brussels is the weekend before Phoenix because I kind of expect it, this deck to have a really good weekend, and then it's going to be on everyone's radar. So if I decided to audible to it for Phoenix, I don't have the surprise factor anymore, which is a bit of a bummer. I'll hold but. on there because I think this is like one of Kethis's like better matchups. Yeah, funny, funny like, enough, the other deck we've been funny working, enough. Yeah, the deck we've been spending all just of our time <laughs> also testing is just very very favored against inverter of truth funny yeah enough, but diligent excavator can actually mill your opponents as well you know yeah. so, wow i forgot it could do that yeah. <laughs> that's how you win you gotta mill them right yeah yeah uh so. yeah that's uh yeah <laughs> so maybe that is how you next level the entire format the inverter of truth has a great weekend this weekend a bunch of people bring it to phoenix and then you just smash them all with kethis it's all coming up dope. <laughs> yeah it's, uh, i do no, this one's like definitely good though i think it's like definitely tier one it's like brand new it's only been out a week so mm -hmm. if people have like you know the cojones to like register it for a pt i think they can be you know very uh yeah heavily rewarded for that one because yeah. this deck does like i mean uh, the person I, it really it just comes down to how tuned the list is because they're still you know so much discourse over you know the best sideboard options we you know how you're building your mana base, what what are you playing in your main deck, well, you know, it because it's still well, so new, right? No one has really figured it out yet. It seems like sideboarding is, like, really tough with this one. Just be, Well, not, sorry, how do I say? Uh, because, like, with sideboarding in this deck, it doesn't seem like you have a bunch of stuff you can side out, right? Because you're never taking out a dig. You're never taking out a, maybe take it one dig. Yeah, so dig, like, out a dig's one of those ones. I don't think I'd ever cut more than one. If I, you're expecting your opponent to go hard on something like rest in peace, then I, I'm fine shaving a dig. But, you know, there's a lot of cards you you wouldn't necessarily touch. I think Thought Erasure is a pretty easy side out in a lot of matchups. Drown the Lock just seems bad to me. Yeah, Drown, Drown so. of the Lock is definitely, you know, not the best option, but it, it fills a decent role in the deck, I think. But it is yes. an easy side out in a lot of spots as well. Um, like off bot sees dig fasa inverter all seem like just absolutely can't take yeah i mean you can I mean, like, you can yeah. generally you can shave a jace here or there like the deck we're looking at is playing three jace uh i've played two for most of my yeah. testing i've played only two i haven't moved up to three my third jace has been a scarab god in the main deck but you know if you're not expecting to see as much decks like mono black i could see just going harder on your combo and you know, funny enough, with the yeah. Niv the Niv to Light decks being popular as well, they just play main deck um, on Mort Ego, which can kind of yeah. cheese you. So you know, Scarab oh, God yeah. was kind of a, well of a nod in that direction. So you have another way to win if they get rid of your inverters, because I mean, you're not winning the game with your Jasons and your Thassas against Niv to Light if they get rid of your inverters, yeah. right? So yeah. So I actually, I'm wondering. How much worse does the mana get if you just like add white? Because like, just because it's like blue black, you know, that doesn't have a lot of support in the format, right? But then you get to play like, uh, like Teferi or something like that. Yeah, yeah. So this is I've talked about this a lot with some other people as well, and I've thought about playing Teferi, and you know, the general consensus we all came to was that the decks we have the most trouble with in the format aren't the decks that Teferi's good against. You know, they're the aggressive right. decks, and. It just doesn't really make that much sense to play a more painful mana base for a card that doesn't help you in your worst matchups, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Oh. So that that was that's kind of the reasoning I I went to staying to blue black, and I think everyone else has kind of come to the same realization as well. I haven't thought about you know maybe salt eye. I'm sure there's a lot of you know good cards you could find in a in a color pairing like that, but really three color mana bases in uh, pioneer come with a huge cost as well so 
it, not really sure how much better it actually makes it, even though, you know, your straight blue black mana base is pretty terrible on its own, but... You get an Aetherborn in the sideboard would be nuts if that's what you're struggling with. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, what, I, what I've been doing recently, which this player seems to be doing as well, you know, Legion's End, Cry of the Carnarium, Kalidus, all have been pretty good in the is aggressive the matchups. on Inverter of Truth again? It's an ETB, right? Yeah. All right, here's the strat. You play some sort of hush wing griff hush bringer effect in your sideboard. That's what your white's for. Just uh-huh. to side it in so that you can play six sixes for free. That's got to be that girl. <laughs> <laughs> that is a uh, hush bringer's got or not hush bringer. Uh, yeah, hush bringer's got lifelink. It's not something I thought about. <laughs> There's probably a reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, hey, this deck came from. <laughs> reconsidering bad cards and bad ideas like as an abstract concept of something that happens in magic i like that the unplayable okay. mythic because if it's like horrendous downside breathes life into a new combo as soon as something interacts with it favorably mm-hmm. yeah, that is actually something like really quickly to touch on it's just like you know the stuff that feels like the most broken in magic is when something has like a downside that you can find a way to like turn it into an upside that is so. what inverter does it inverts downsides <laughs> yeah. into upsides yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay yeah. i mean like the most on the nose examples like you know like faith is looting it's like mm-hmm. you pitch you have cards that you want to put in the graveyard so it's actually just like a draw mm-hmm. like yeah. three really <laughs> yeah know? all right moving right along to the next deck blue white control blue white control has been pretty popular on moto especially over the past few weeks and it's been actually putting up a lot of a lot of results you know some of the new new additions from Theros Beyond Death have been picked up. Like, we've been seeing a lot of one of copies of Elspeth's Sun's Nemesis. You only need and one, the, and then it's a bunch of copies as it dies and comes back and dies and comes back. Uh, yeah. I can't imagine playing more than one. Yeah. Also, Thassa's Intervention is another card that has been picked up in Love popularity. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dude, I got ran- Okay, side note. I got ranched in standard by. Uh, uh, Wilderness Reclamation, Expansion Explosion, because they had Thassa's Intervention. And so, like, the turn that they couldn't kill me, they just dumped, like, 30 mana into it and, like, got their two cards that they needed and then killed me. Yeah, that seems pretty good. Yeah. Scry- <laughs> it's like dig through time, except seven, you know. You, uh, this is the whole deck. He's a tutor. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was it was a lot. But, uh, yeah, this blue white control. You talked about it earlier that it's, like, uh, because of the proactive requirements of Pioneer, it's playing more as a super friends. Like, we have... Uh, yeah, the Elspeth, Hero of Dominaria, Elspeth, Sun's Champion, to just make a bunch of 1-1s. One um, and then your, your usual control deck, some Wraths, Supreme Verdict being the best Wrath in the format, Settle the Wreckage as, like, situational counterspells and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's playing, like, kind of just enough counterspells so that it can, like, have game against, like, the Lotus Field decks and, like, the combo decks or whatever. But then other than that, it's basically just trying to stick a Planeswalker and then, excuse me, Verdict and then, you know, win. Yeah. Right? Like, that's... Pretty much all it is, right? Like, mm-hmm. yep. Playing like cards like Azorius Charm, and like even like just even Sensor, right? Like normally Sensor is kind of like a dopey card, right? But the fact that like it cycles to get you like closer to like a Walker or like a Wrath or whatever, but also just like stops your opponent's like early play, right? That's that's yeah. all that you know. That's exactly <laughs> what this deck wants. Actually. Yeah, it's like a mini Thassa's intervention. Right? Yeah, I know. Uh, I know. You know, another tro. Uh, big trophy getter on Moto right now has been LSV and all of his trophies have been with blue white control. So he's been seeing a lot of success with this deck as well. And you can really kind of see like the, like uh, the format kind of coming through and comparing because like both syncopate and sensor were both in the same standard. Right. And like mm-hmm. at that time, like, it, like the numbers would be flipped, right. You'd be playing multiples of syncopate and maybe one sensor, but probably not even like one sensor. Whereas now it's like, you know, plus or minus like a syncopate, you could include it or disclude or whatever, you know, but you're playing like four sensor, like locked. Yeah. Right. Because like you're just trying to survive until you hit a planeswalker that takes over the game. Right. Mm-hmm. I definitely think this is going to be a popular archetype at the players' tours this weekend. Generally, you know, control tends to be a popular strategy among, you know, pro players and such. And the de- the deck's very good. But yeah, if you're deck building for the draw bracket, you got to keep this one in mind. <laughs> I don't know. I don't have too much to say about blue white control. It's not a deck I've really played uh, much, have, but I've spent a lot of time beating up on it. That's for sure. 
I feel like it's weird that it's like seeing this resurgence now because I feel like maybe it's just like one of those decks that gets better when like better people pilot it or something, but like it hasn't changed really at all since the format's inception. Mm-hmm. Right? Like the Planeswalker suite has changed. People are a little less reliant on Teferi 3, I guess. But, you know, it's still just like four opt, four Azorius Charm, four Sensor, four Verdict, basically. Yep. Uh, that's it. No mm-hmm. real changes. And, you know, sometimes people say it's unplayable and sometimes people say it's the best deck in format. So, like, I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? I typically don't have uh, a problem with it. I usually am pretty happy to see blue-white control on the other side. But then, you know, maybe if it's somebody who's very good at, like, blue-white strategies, it's, like, different. Because yeah. I do think this is, like, a deck that, like, there's a very small amount of error, room for error. Like, there's just, there's just none. Yeah, exactly. Right? Like, yeah, the margins are pretty thin, so you know, would not be scared at F and M. Would be scared at the PT. So. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, let's move on to the deck that we've actually mentioned a bunch of times already when talking about other decks in the format. Niv to Light, five color Niv Mizzet Reborn deck. This was kind of the flash, not flash in the pan, but the sort of breakout deck a few weeks ago. A bunch of people wrote about it. A bunch of people sort of got hyped about it back then. Uh, I guess it's been tuned a bit since then, but still around. Yeah, it kind of just exploded onto the format where I put like four copies of a of it into the Pioneer Challenge one weekend, just out of nowhere. Wow, that probably really brought the deck to light. <laughs> get, get, uh... get that. <laughs> yeah, all four all, all four builds of the deck were you know relatively different, and uh, now people have kind of been kind of moving in on a more kind of centralized deck. And the deck we're looking at right now, uh, Matt Folks, he's a magic streamer, has been working on this deck a lot. And I think a lot of people have moved to something similar to what he's been playing recently. And so, uh, I think, well, like Niv Delight kind of gets born out of like the same stuff that we were talking about before is that in general, threats are better than than answers, right? Yeah, the sort of like caveat to that is that okay, well, if you just like play a mid range deck that just goes over way over the top of all the other mid range decks, then like you know, I guess you sort of can play answers if they're in this like sort of toolbox format, right? Because that's mm-hmm. a lot of the problem is that like answers are narrow, so you play like one of each and then you just play, you know, bring to light and Niv is like you know a tutor for whatever, and then Niv is like a draw for plus a dragon that like yeah. is bigger than everything else everybody else is playing, right? So like. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. You know, this is it's funny though, because like for a while in the format for those couple weeks, the best decks in the format were either monocolor or like literally just like five color playing like trilands, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, very opposite ends of the spectrum, which is kind of weird. But I mean, you know, the advantage this deck has had on a lot of people, and I mean still has, is that you know, when you're playing against it, you never really know what to expect. Because you your opponent could just have actually anything. (laughs) <laughs> so it's it's hard or, to you know play around a lot of things because what are you even playing around right especially on moto because nib is bug is it is like yeah because well, like oh Niv, yeah it doesn't a, it doesn't tell you what they put in their hand yeah. right no if you draw two of the same color combination so like what nib says you know it says uh you know look at top 10 for every color pair that exists you can put one of those cards in your hand Mm-hmm. Um, but you're supposed to be able to see which one it is. And on Moto, uh, if they reveal two, say, green, uh, green blue cards or something, um, like if they reveal like an Uro and a Bring Delight, it doesn't tell you which one they took. Mm-hmm. So you really don't know what you got. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, Hell as old as time. Moto. Yeah. Yeah. But this deck, it, I mean, it's incredibly powerful. It's still been, you know, putting up decent results in the format. Why, what are you yeah, laughing so, about? I, the like bug on like showing your opponent what they take or not reminded me of an experience I had on Arena, where uh, I was playing in the metagame challenge and I got paired against someone and I like thought erasured them and they had mismeric sprites and stuff and I was like, oh, this is like an interesting mono blue brew, until I accidentally hovered over their deck and it was 160 cards, so they're just played I guess all the blue cards they owned, <laughs> and I was playing Esper Hero, and I resolved an Atris Oracle of Half Truths. And I got to experience them trying to understand the UI of how to resolve this fact or fiction. <laughs> the first time it resolved, there were three face down cards. So I'm like, okay, thank you for the draw three. <laughs> then they bounced it. And so I played it again. <laughs> the next time they figured since that didn't work, they put all three cards face up. <laughs> and so I just took three again. <laughs> oh man. Uh, fun times. Fun times. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. But yeah, Hemsley, how do you feel about uh, Niv to Light right now? Um, well, when it first started winning, I honestly just thought it was a complete meme. Like, you know, it just seems... So did I. Jank. So did I. <laughs> Like, you know what I mean? Like the five color. Oh yeah. This is, it was going to just kind of get like accommodated to But the thing is like the no bad card lists, you know, like mono black and, and mono red or whatever, you know, there's nothing really you can do to adjust to this, right? They're just going to donk on you all day. Right. Because like they have the flexibility that, you know, to play whatever they want to literally. And you're just like not quick enough. Mm -hmm. Right. Which is kind of where we see, we talked about like the, the updated big red list before that goes like underneath stuff. Right. Which is like directly in response to matchups, like nip to light you know, this, these decks existing, right? Yeah. Because, like, in a well-balanced format where, like, every kind of, like, avenue is, like, kind of equally represented and, like, viable, something like Nymph Delight I don't think, like, exists because you're just going to get dunked on by Swift Spear, right? But if, like, the Swift Spear decks aren't really represented or playable, then you can kind of, like, take advantage of that and just, like, go over the top of all the other mid-range decks, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what this deck is doing. Yeah, you're you're never winning a mid-range mid -range fight versus this deck. It's the uh, same exactly. reason that uh, four and five color piles are good in limited formats that have a lot of fixing because those formats by nature of having a lot of fixing are a bit slower and there aren't really like good aggro decks in that many limited formats. It, you're just seeing it in a constructed event. It, and like basically all the aggro decks that you would expect to punish this kind of just like fold to Supreme Verdict and you're playing five copies of Supreme Verdict, right? So yeah. Something like Stompy, right? Okay, sure, you have your Galta, but then, you know, I'm going to bring to light find a verdict and, you know, you lose, basically, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> and, you know, funny enough, I actually think this deck is might be the best Teferi Time Raveler deck in the entire format just because uh, of Bring to Light. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Being able to Bring to Light at instant speed is like bananas. Mm -hmm. um, although, ironically, Teferi Time Raveler also very good against this deck because it means that you can't Bring to Light at all. Yeah, exactly. So, it's a weird, like... <laughs> The mirror matches get kind of you know? <laughs> yeah. The mirror matches get kind of messed up <laughs> in that sense, but Paradise Druid uh, probably does a lot of work in the mirror. Just attack it to fairies. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. If your opponent doesn't have a a Sylvan carried it right, which and you know, funny enough, a lot of the mono black decks. I mean, the deck we looked at earlier had a self inflicted wound in it in its sideboard, and a lot of the decks had had to move towards that card you know three copies of that card in its main deck to be able to fight this deck because if you just let a carry out it go unchecked they it blocks everything you know ramps them yeah. into their niv mizzets and you know you could pick off a niv mizzet with self-inflicted wound too but it's been interesting to see how the aggressive decks have adjusted to this deck existing in the format i mean huge testament to black again just being able to adjust the stuff the fact that you yeah you know you have a tart Card that like kills Sylvan carried it for two mana and also shocks you. Yeah. <laughs> so well, that's pretty good. Um, but still, like it's pretty hard. Like, this is still like a horrible matchup for them. Uh, this is maybe, I guess, like I said that before that like Mono Black doesn't have any really bad matchups. And like Niv, it's it's not as bad for them as it is for like Mono Red, for example, unless you're playing like the lower to the ground version. It's like new, probably pretty good here. Yeah. But you know, it's still definitely like a good one. And so this that's this is just looking to dunk on all these like mid-range kind of strats, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, Probably yeah. inherently bad against combo, which is like why you see this like on Mort Ego main deck, I guess, to give you like some some game against like Lotus Field or whatever, and like Kethis, I guess, and the four rest in peace on the board. Yeah, you exactly. Know, notably not like a multi colored card, right? Yeah. They're just like, all right, we'll just jam for. Well, yeah, rest. that is that it's is the that is the exact weakness of this deck, right? Like you're not winning games fast with this strategy, so well, you are getting ground out. So you need a way to like not have the game end immediately. You know what I mean? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and like the creatures aren't doing it because they don't really exist. But uh, yeah, you're a little weak to combo here, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, let's uh, let's move on to the next deck on the list that has seen a pretty big resurgence recently. Is it in Soul, a deck that essentially dropped off the map after Smuggler's Copter got banned, has recently made this big resurgence and is seeing a lot more play on Moto? Um, what, Hemsley? Why do you think this deck is kind of starting to see more popularity again? Uh, it's same more popularity because people started, they, they just added more land. Honestly, that's, that's what it is. <laughs> is that like people just like ported it over from when like smugglers copter existed and they kept the same number of lands and then people just like never drew an like appropriate amount. Right. Like this thing actually wants like three or four. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, so like that's, that's literally what it is. Right. Like people were playing like 2021 20, for a long time and now all the lists are up to 22. Um, you know, turns out that you know get to playing you, you know you play your spells you know good things happen right like i don't know yeah yeah uh, 
I mean, That's, you do, um, but it, like, this deck's very aggressive too, which can, it, it's good to get under, you know, the five color decks and you cheese out a lot of wins with Shrapnel Blast, which can be very awkward to play against. Uh, so this one, like, I think falls again into kind of like the, um, the cards are like half good sort of decks, right? Where like the high roll is just like so high that you can do some like degenerate things. Right? Like, if you're playing a deck that just, like... Like, a lot of decks in the format just can't answer turn two insult artifact on, you know... Uh, anything. The Darksteel Citadel. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, anything in general, but, like, yeah. the Darksteel Citadel, right? Like, even if you have, like, Fatal Potion, I'm like, okay, that's... Yeah. That's nuts putting on the Darksteel, right? Yeah. But then you also have, like, a lot of draws for this deck where you're playing, you know, multiple copies of Ginger Brute, and, you know, you don't find, you know, a plating or whatever, you know? Yeah, and you're just forced to attack with one ones and you know two twos, and then lose. <laughs> yeah. Basically, right? Like, I mean, you had those games like Affinity and Modern too for a while, where like, you know, that was always like a big point of contention between people. It was like, do you mull for a plating or do you mull for a ravager? Like, that's champion and match for that matter. Or you just like keep your seven because like you need all your pieces. You'll find one eventually. And like the problem with like, you know, like the the uh, the strategy of like keeping all your your hands that have like acceleration and stuff like that is that some of the times like, yeah, you, you know, you're just attacking with, you know, two ornithopters and a signal pest. And that's what it feels like uh, with this one is that if you don't keep a hand with, you know, actually this one, you probably should just like mulligan until you find, you know, at least like a skilled animator or something. But like, yeah. you know, there are a lot of hands with this deck you kind of have to keep and you're just making like a ginger brute and then you're making a bowmat courier and then you're making like a two, two stone coil serpent and you're just kind of chilling until, you know, you find something that does something. <laughs> yeah, like like you said, I, I don't really fault anyone for picking this deck for any given weekend. Like your nut draws are absolutely insane. Uh, oh yeah, like for sure. Honestly, like any of these decks that we've talked about, even if I personally have like issues with them, like I think they're all like very reasonable to take the Pro Tour, right? That's why like we're talking about them at all. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's like, this is like, like, the high rolls in this deck are like absurd. So, and like there are some decks that just like literally can't, you know, beat what you're doing. Like you put a, you have like a, you know, a clock on people. You're playing like stubborn denial, right? So you have like, you know, protection and stuff like that. You know, um, I think this deck is like in, in on average, like very good against the field. But like it, the problem with it is that, you know, when it lows, rolls low, it like rolls real, real low. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. But I mean, decks like, decks like that aren't necessarily always that bad if you're looking to spike a tournament, right? Uh, that's for sure, right? Like, you, you got to get lucky anyway to win, you know, one of these. So, mm -hmm. you know, might as well take, like, the all-upside deck, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. Yeah. Next up on our list, we have Azorius Spirits. Took second place at the Showcase Challenge this past weekend on Moto. I know, Matt, you, there's a special place in your heart for Nebelgast Herald, four of in this deck. <laughs> uh, 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 God, like, I understand why it's there, obviously, and, like, it, it fills a role, and, like, it fills, like, a hole this deck has, but, like, holy moly, does that card just suck. <laughs> it's one of these decks that's halfway there, you know, like, obviously, like, Mausoleum Wanderer, that card's sweet. Uh, Supreme Phantom, you know, Two Metal Lord, very good. You know, Brazen Bar, notably not a spirit, but card's sweet. Yeah, plays a role. Uh, Spell Color... Spell color, obviously not. Uh, that card's great. But then you're also just playing, uh, you know, Spectral Sailor. And then <laughs> we're playing uh, Nibblegeist Herald. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't even think, like, Rattle Chains and Self of Spirit are that good. Like, Rattle Chains is, like, fine, I guess. But, like, all your stuff has Flash mostly anyway. So that doesn't help too much. Yeah, Rattle Chains is, like, a negate. I don't know. It's, like, it kind of plays yeah. this role that you were talking about earlier, that, like, if you do play removal, you need it to be tacked to a creature. This is a counterspell on a creature. Mm-hmm. That's true that's for sure like you know if you're trying to just like shock something or you know it's it's obviously like very good against something like uh like blue white or whatever against like i don't know stompy or something it's not doing too much but yeah this is so, the sort of deck that if for some reason a standard set in the future has a spirits theme this will probably be pushed to prominence yeah exactly so like it's, it's just a couple cards away right because a couple of these cards like they're fine but they're not really good right like you're yeah not, you know, in certain matches, you're obviously like happy to draw like the Nimble Guys Herald. That's like sort of why it's here, mm -hmm. right? It's like a response to some of these decks that are just like playing, you know, five fives to three. Um, but it's definitely not a like card away. that like people were excited to build this deck around. It was added yeah. after like a gatherer <laughs> yeah. search because they had 56 cards. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's, you know, uh, when, you know, Pioneer came out and we were just like sitting around because I was actually up in Ottawa that weekend and like we were just like hanging around like brewing up decks, you know. People definitely talked about Spellqueller. 
Uh, don't remember anybody bringing up nimble gas Harold. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, guess, yeah. guess the people you're hanging out with just weren't big brained enough. What can I say? It's, you know what? <laughs> we all have tiny smooth brains. Confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'll, I've, I run into this deck a decent amount of the time on moto now and you oh. definitely, they definitely have some very good draws that, you know, a lot of the decks in the format just can't really keep up with. And uh, so well, I remember I used to get like get tilted when I like get paired against this with like the, like the big red deck, because like you actually couldn't win. <laughs> right. Like that match was impossible. Right. Like, can you imagine just like getting like your Chandra spell colored and then like you try to play like a, you know, rabble match. Oh, I get spell colored. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, the match was like really bad, but like there's so much of the format that I think just like has like a good matchup against this one. And like, even like your good matchups, you just like don't draw the good cards then you know yeah whatever yeah i'm not i'm not very high on this one but there definitely is a lot of potential here and i like cam alluded to i wouldn't be surprised to see this deck start really putting up some good results with you know a key addition because it's very close yeah it's definitely, it's definitely one close. of the that's close um people also just like to play it you know mm-hmm. spirits is like historically i think a deck like in modern and you know back in standard even like uh Obviously, it's just, you know, people like to play blue-white things with Flash. Yeah. Like, Geist of Saint Trath was played well beyond its expiry date in Modern just because that card's sweet. Like, who can blame them, right? Like mm-hmm. That is not a card I've seen played in a very long time. Wow. Oh, sir. <laughs> it, it is not. All right, we're closing um, closing in on the end of our list here, so let's fly through yeah. it. Uh, yeah, the ramp that we can just put together. Yeah, the next next up we have Mono Green Ramp and Civic Ramp. You know, Mono Green Ramp was one of the early winners in the format, and it's kind of fallen to the wayside recently. You don't see too much of it anymore. It ramped out a couple bands, and then the really band sort of ate it. it. Yeah. I really got hurt by Field of Ruin, or uh, sorry, not Field of Ruin, Field of Dead ban. Also, like a little bit uh, once upon a time, but like not that much. Yeah. yeah, just typical ramp strategies. Like your huge top end Ulamog is in the format, so they're playing these World Breakers in the format. Those are being played. Ugin the Spirit Dragon, uh, is still just an incredibly powerful planeswalker. It cleans up everything. Like none of the decks we've talked about outside of, I guess, Inverter, are playing colorless cards. I guess oh, Scissors as well has some colorless cards, yeah. but that's, I mean, Ugin might be too slow there anyway. But like every everything else is just yeah. playing like colored permanents, so it's just a huge wrath. Um, and then you just have yeah. other like payoff cards, like Uro Bridges into your mid game crisis, just a classic ramp payoff, just typical so, ramp decks. A band I was playing like a lot of ramp actually because I didn't really think that it had that many you know bad matches in the field, kind of like was busted, and I pretty sure I'm playing it. But uh, <laughs> um, what, the reason that drew, like I that drew me to the deck though was that that's exactly it is that Ugin seems like a trump card this whole format, right? Yeah, is that if you land an Ugin, like you should just win. I guess more recently, although like the list that you brought up here, the one's playing three, the other one's playing four, is that like the kind of trend after Field of, of the Dead got banned was people would play Cavalier of Thorns instead, instead of the uh, the five mana two or two lands. Uh, don't remember what's called. Our called. Promise. Uh, Our Promise, right. Yeah. So they cut that out. They played the Cavalier. Cavalier spiked on Moto. I don't know what it is now, but it was like 50 bucks at one point because everyone just started playing that deck. <laughs> um, but Not, like kind yeah. of played... Uh, you know, four like Cavalier of Thorns and like four World Breakers, and then scaled it back like two Ulamog and two Ugin. And I hated that because like the whole point to the deck was that like Ugin's like this trump card. And like if you're playing ramp, you need the thing you ramp into to be like, you know, proactive and game ending, right? Like mm-hmm. you can't just like try to have like five sixes end the game, right? Because like, you know, that's just like not good enough, <laughs> right? Yeah. There were so many times you'd like play against this deck or play the deck, and they would like Cavalier of Thorns and mill over one of the two Ugins. But it's just like, well, if I just never kill this Cavalier, like how am I ever, like you know, and like get them, let them have their Ugin, like you know, how are they, how are they killing me, yeah. right? Like we just like jump it and then you know go around it, you know, we do something, right? Like we just like let them have this five six, you know, I can take four hits from from that thing, you know, like <laughs> well, like three hits, I guess, but, like. It just, it just didn't matter, right? Like, mm-hmm. uh, so it's good to see like the list get back to like four Ugin. I think that's like strong, and this deck's like still fine. Uro gives it a lot of, a lot of life. Yeah. Well, oh, the, okay, bigger two Ugin. The bigger, the yeah. biggest <laughs> weakness for this deck has generally been, you know, the combo decks that are just kind of playing a linear game plan, and you know, they're you're not really winning fast enough to be able to kill them before the decks get to combo off, like. 
the breach storm decks, also the inverter of truth deck, mono like green ramp decks are a buy for that deck. Also, uh, I, I'm trying to think. Does 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 this even have like a good matchup against like Niv? I honestly don't know. Like Ugin has to like Ugin can clear up like their board, but then if they Niv, they like draw a bunch, and they can like bring to light to like get the Niv on their turn. I don't know. Like Ulamog also seems like probably pretty good. Like pound terrains. Like <laughs> yeah, it's always a good shot. Uh, yeah, I, I just I I'm not sure how that went. It's actually probably pretty even, I guess, which is like kind of a bummer because you'd want like every single mid range matchup to be like an auto win for for your ramp deck, right? That's just like how it is with Tron and stuff. Like, yeah, yeah. The fact that a mid range deck exists that probably has like a like at least an even matchup, maybe not like a good matchup, maybe not even like maybe like you're still like sixty percent against that deck, but like you you want to be like really favored against like mid range strategies when you're playing ramp just because you're so. Uh, susceptible to like fast combo and stuff mm-hmm. yeah and i feel like your mono black matchup is generally pretty poor i i don't think i ever lost to a, a green ramp deck when i was playing mono black variants the you know you're just a well-timed thought sees was generally good enough to pick apart their their draws and just yeah, that's really, really well you needed you need a field of ruin like hard against or field of, i keep saying field of ruin Field of the dead, you need it, right? Because that was like a non thought seizable thing that's going to clog up the board. You make them kill you with a rankle. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, don't have that no more. Nope. All right. Next up, we have Golgari Stompy, which we kind of talked about, we think is bad. But, you know, a lot of people just die to three mana seven sixes and three mana five fours and, uh, you know, two mana yeah. 12 12. I mean, what are you going to do, right? That's, that's, you, you, there is no deck that better epitomizes threats or better than answers than model green or like the green splash black you know yeah. it's uh it's pretty bananas um i think this deck gained a ton from the black splash right just like figuring out that the great hinge is a good enough mana kind of like dump that's going to power out your stuff yeah that you don't need nykthos and actually just start playing you know fatal push thoughts using the board mm-hmm. yeah elvish mystic lana uh, ralph still incredibly busted cards <laughs> and yep. you know ramping out these huge three drops I mean, you're gonna kill a lot of people very quickly. And I mean, you register pretty, uh, pretty good. Yeah, I mean, we we're pumping uh, Inverter of Truth tires earlier a lot, but that deck has a very hard time against strategies like this. They they just yeah. put you under the gun right away, and you're just not fast enough to yeah. be able to deal with them. Yeah, playing Kethis, this is like the matchup I just can't win. Right, like mm-hmm. I, I we've. I think our our board plan actually is like very good against it and brings it back up to like acceptable. But man, turn one elves is tough. It's not yeah. what you want to see. Yeah, but you know, outside of those uh, those combo matchups, I'm not really that high on this type of deck right now. Oh, uh, yeah, I think it just like folds to like supreme verdict, right? Like, yeah, I mean, you're never beating blue white control in a million years, uh, unfortunately. And I think but. That- yeah, control is going to be pretty well represented. So I, I'm not so hyped about bringing this from the PT, but like, I don't know, maybe Thoughtseize doesn't want to work in the board than like I thought. Yeah, you're definitely more, you're much better off than the straight mono green decks were for sure. But uh, And resolved Great Henge, you know, at least to like, you know, that's actually probably a pretty big game. It's pretty easy to answer it, right? Because you just like bounce it with whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but the fairy, but uh, talk it with the fairy five rather, I guess. All right, well, let's hop on over to uh, your deck for the tournament, uh, Kethis Combo. So yeah. you've been putting up, you know, many, many 5-0s online with this deck. You've iterated on it a lot. And uh, kind of where are you with the strategy now? Um, so, I mean, like, the reason why we started to, like, look at the, the Kethis deck was when Heliod was, like, uh, spoiled, right? Um, we kind of decided it wasn't good enough to play Heliod uh, it's a combo piece, um, and I think that's like half right. Is that most decks it's not, but if you're playing a dedicated combo strategy, then I think it's like fine. Uh, especially if putting the Heliod combo in a deck that already exists, like you don't want to jam that in like Breach or whatever, because there's like literally like no no synergy. Yeah, it's just kind of out of place. Like like yeah, it doesn't yeah. play well with your main combo at all. Oh, but unlike that with Kethis, it actually does right play with your your main combo because like Heliod is uh, legendary, which works well with uh, Kethis. Obviously, at the time we were playing, uh, Josh had like a Kethis build that was playing like Traverse, and we were like excited that this was another card type to put in the bin. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've since cut Traverse uh, mostly because like uh, green playing too much green makes the mana uh, untenable. But um, still, like this gives you a way to like combo kill without using the graveyard. Ballista itself is actually overperformed. 
to like the highest possible degree in this deck. Like it's actually bananas how good Walking Ballista is with Emery. Like it's insane. Yeah. Um, that's that's a late game in and of itself, right? Like some games, like you flood or you just like go long, like you an- they answer your pieces or whatever. And you just like have like six or seven mana line around. And you just like have Emery Ballista. You just make a 3 3 Ballista each turn. It's bananas. Mm-hmm. Um, and even like early against like Mono Black, which is one of his decks bad matchups, it's just, you know, block one, pain the other, it just buys you time. Um, but like we wanted to kind of like explore the format a little bit because like people at the time were playing like Mono Black, uh, Mono Red. You know, it, it just felt weird to us that like in an eternal format, the best thing you could be doing is like, you know, a mono colored mid range strategy, right? So we're just like, you know, Let's try to like push the you know envelope a little bit. Let's try to break stuff. Let's kind of go into some less explored yeah. territory. And the healing mode combo is basically just an excuse to do that, since you know it gives you a non graveyard reliant uh, uh, kill. Um, so you know I could talk like probably for like an entire podcast about how we got to this like final <laughs> build. Uh, but this deck is like extremely hard to tune and build, mostly because you have the additional requirement that you need enough legends. Um, yet you still have cards that need to fill specific roles um, and you need to make the mana work, right? So for example, we hated Jace as like the win con because it felt so bad in your bad matchups to draw it against like mono black or mono red. Like it just was horrendous, yeah. right? So yeah. we wanted to try out like Tashar plus like Thassa's Oracle because Thassa's Oracle at least is like a 1-3, right? And that actually is like really relevant against decks like mono black because all of their one mana stuff with the exception of like a knight is like a 2-1. So like the body is super relevant and like scrying to help find your pieces pretty good. Then that meant that like you needed to put more like white in the mana, right? You need a double blue, right? You didn't yeah. need, uh, you know, well, you need a double blue. I guess like it's strictly easier to cast in like Jace or whatever, right? But like, you know, you needed a Tashar, right? Um, which, you know, actually ended up taking up more spots, right? But like, then you have like the legend, because Thassa is also like not a legend. So like, you know, mm-hmm. there's just like a lot there. And it changes the mana, it changes like the legend count. It changes a bunch of different stuff. Yeah, it ended um, up just not really being necessary at all in the grand scheme of things. Oh, yeah, we like the Tashar, but we don't like the Oracle. We yeah. found out, yeah, when you have the yeah. Ballista as the backup kill, you actually don't even need that. You can just mill them out, and it's totally fine. Yeah. Um, because a lot of times when you're playing the Tasharless version that had Traverse, you, your wing con was just like, you would just mill yourself out by like looping Emery. That was all you needed to do. You didn't have to worry about milling them, and you just like find your Jace eventually. Yeah. Um, now you have to worry about killing, uh, milling them a little bit. Uh, Our helps with that because you just get, eventually gets the escalators back. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so what, one of the, like a, a couple of the things that we changed uh, the mana base before was like very bad because you're playing a lot of green spells. So we basically cut all the green that's not Kethis and Braska in the bin or in the in the sideboard, right? And we also because we're playing the ballista combo, we have enough artifacts that we can play Spire of Industry and having mana confluence five and six is like huge. It's like huge game. Yeah. Especially combined when you, you know, have less green, right? So the mana's been completely fine. Uh, we also added a 23rd land uh, because we're playing a lot of four drops mostly in the board, but that also just helps the mana. So like since we started tuning it, the mana's been like kind of a non-issue, which I think is a lot of... I mean, that uh, says a lot uh, in, the, in your four-color, you know, combo deck, so... Yeah, but, you're, you know, we're playing like Terraria and we have like six lands that tap for everything and then like everything else is like, you know, we're playing no basics, right? So like... I don't know, like there hasn't been like a when I when we picked up the deck originally, there were tons of spots where like we would draw the appropriate cards and like the appropriate number of legends and like wouldn't be able to cast stuff because we didn't have the mana, right? Because people are playing like Grizzly Salvage or like Uro or sometimes play like Goose, which I think is like really bad, but you know, because and they needed all this green, right? But when, when you cut all the green and you add the more mana confluence effects, you know, the mana has been like pretty fine as far as you write four color goes. Yeah. But when we were, when we were playing, one of the things we noticed was we had like a, a huge win rate in game ones, right? Even with the uh, ballistic combo, the win rate uh, when they started putting in Graver Hate went like really far down, right? So, like we were winning something like seventy five percent of our like game ones against the field, which was like pretty huge, right? But then like post board, it was going down to like thirty to five to like forty percent, right? That's mm-hmm. not great, right? And it's because yeah. like we didn't have the answers. Like, well, we had answers to Graveyard Hate, but the problem was we kind of realized was that you basically just like lost to the graveyard hate. Like you lost to the rest in, the rest in peace trigger as much as you lost to the actual rest in peace. Yeah. Right. Because like, unlike when you play the second standard where they play a graveyard, uh, you know, they play like a, um, a cage or whatever, a ley line, you can just like set up for a turn and then bounce it with the fairy and then go off. Right. Whereas here you don't really have that opportunity. Right. Because 
if they play a rest in peace, you need to spend resources and time answering the rest in peace. But then from there, then you need to start comboing. This is exactly right? what we said in our proactive versus reactive sideboard cards episode. Yeah. This was the exact point we made. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was completely untenable, right? So we kind of wanted, like, so obviously like having the list in there helped, right? Um, but we wanted the sideboard to reflect, you know, we want to be able to like, exploit people who are going to take time out to like turn three on more ego you or lost legacy you right so we decided that like we want the board to play like just a bunch of mid-range cards for like those matchups yep right so we experimented like a huge you know uh mid-range suite we're talking like gideon four like gideon ally of zendikars you know Veraska's, kalidas's uh here uh heart of currents because we're playing all these planeswalkers yeah you know liliana the last hope Basically, just like not exactly like a transformational cyborg because you, you can trim the combo a little bit, but you're still kind of working towards that. And like these kind of mid range threats are just mostly to buy time and also just like go over the top of people when they just like, you know, keep a hand that's like, you know, like one drop greater hate, greater hate, like land, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that's kind of like what broke stuff open, right? So, like, my current iteration of the cyborg has like multiple copies of Kalidus, it has like multiple Supreme Verdicts, multiple copies of like Veraska, multiple copies of like Fatal Push and Thought Season stuff. And the idea is basically just, uh, you know, when you go to the board games, try to get like your, you know, match game one win because you're pretty favored against like the field. There are decks like uh, Insole and like Mono Black and like Breach that definitely have game, but decks like Ramp, uh, Control, these are pretty much free game ones. Um, yeah, I mean, your your matchup game one versus Control is just so insanely good. Like uh, it, well, so, it's almost yeah. a buy. It's yeah. Well, the Emery Lock is so huge there, which I haven't even talked about yet. But yeah. like Emery Lock wins you just as many games against like Control and, and, and Niv Delight is actually like comboing them off. Like I've had so many people scoop to just like turn one Hope, turn two Emery, and then you just start looping them. And then obviously like the nail in the coffin is playing your own to fairy three, and then they just like can't cast on creature spells the rest of the game. Yeah. So I mean like that, <laughs> that's pretty you know, good. Those ones. Yeah. So I mean like the, the, well yeah so not only are we killing them with like Helia Ballista or just like combo killing them with Kathis, we also just have like the Emery lock, right? So it's like a very, you know, controlling strategy in, in that sense, I guess. Not yeah. that it was, you know, it's a control deck or anything, but like, <laughs> you know, it's kind of like has that lock, right? Yeah. And then post board, you just start playing all these like elements that can win through rest in peace and address sort of like the, uh, the aggro problem, right? Things like Kalidus is pretty good. And like the fatal pushes and whatever have been fine play that kind of like longer game because like the thing that like you know uh that these th things represent is they represent like more cards is like the best way i can put it right because if somebody's trying to race you and then you're trying to race them with a the combo right in the same way that them playing rest in peace you know makes them spend more time answering the rest in peace than it took you to play it you know when we throw down like a gideon and we just start making tokens it takes them more time to answer the gideon than it took us to play the gideon so it gives us space to assemble the pieces that we need yeah right? so you're playing these like mid-range strategies that sometimes they just win because your opponent can't you know deal with the Gideon, which is like pretty reasonable, but then the majority of the time they're just like there to just buy time and space, so you can play other stuff. You know, yeah, there's definitely a lot going for this deck, and I I've enjoyed it a lot playing it. Uh, only thing is, I, I I tend to time out a decent amount <laughs> playing oh, yeah. on Moto. So, I'm not so a on very Moto, fast totally clicker. Fine. On Moto, I'm totally fine. I've never had like any problems like almost timing out but I've got the deck in paper and I'm trying to goldfish it. And like, I'm, I'm just confusing my, myself, right? <laughs> I've played like a ton of matches with this deck. I know exactly what's going on, but the fact that you have to like keep your graveyard in like multiple piles of like what Kathis is like seen and what it's not seen. And you don't want to like miss like, you know, a legend that's like hiding in your like 30 card graveyard. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, I don't know. I'm gonna have to get like a lot of paper reps with this if I'm gonna play it, but. Uh, just use the dredge style graveyard yeah. where it's like laid out so that every card is visible underneath your lands. Except that, like, okay, but then you have, like you have multiple piles of like graveyards for stuff that Kethis has seen and hasn't seen. Yeah, multiple. and you also typically have like forty permanents and well, not forty permanents, but right, you'll have like twenty permanents in play, right? Because you're getting your excavators back. Buy a big stuff is dying. <laughs> Take a giant play <laughs> to the pro tour and just shoulder like elbow people it's, it's away. Pretty crazy. You get like a lot of permanents, and then like this stuff is like dying to like legend rule. I'm trying not to like GVR myself because like that's definitely <laughs> possible. Like, <laughs> and, like I, I wouldn't even blame people, right? Like if I just like have like an opal or not an opal, a mox, and, like, cast another mox and, like, do my triggers and resolve my triggers and then just, like, have two opals in play, I just, like, snap, be like, ah, this guy's cheating, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, just try yeah. to, like, war like GVR me out of the game while I'm comboing, you know what I mean? It's, a, like, <laughs> an FNM, obviously, scumbag move, but, you know, at the Pro Tour, that's, like, you know, I don't even, you know, I wouldn't blame the other guy for that, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. 
It's funny enough, I, I was running into similar issues when I was goldfishing it myself the other day in paper because like when my fir- the first times I was trying to combo off, I was just kind of like doing everything in my head, not talking out loud and moving stuff around. And then I'd find myself in the middle of a combo and be like, wait, I don't know which pile is the pile I can still cast from Kethis <laughs> anymore or if I need I know, to activate man. it. So I, I started just like talking out loud to myself and talking through each thing and really making my piles obvious. <laughs> it, it helped a lot, but it was kind of funny the first few yeah. times I tried to do it in paper. I'm also like worried that I'm going to like, there's a situation that comes up on Moto a bunch that it's usually not a big deal, but like I forget that like Mox doesn't just tab for any color because I'm so used to playing with Mox Opal. Mm, yeah. So like there are times where like I'll do this stuff in my head and I'll just be like, oh, I have a Kethis so I can cast this like Emery from the bin, except that now my Mox Amber doesn't tap for blue because it has to be like a legend you control. Yeah. The color like a legend you control. So the Mox taps for white, green, black, but I can't cast like an Emery from the bin if just a Kethis is in play. And like I'll just like try to cheat. <laughs> uh, and thankfully like Moto catches me, but like I, I you know, uh, my, maybe that happens at the Pro Tour, I don't know. Yeah. So well, let's hope not. But <laughs> fingers crossed. Yeah. That's, <laughs> or just call it yeah, on yourself. I, I'm not trying to. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. 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 For sure. But like you know, I I don't even realize that you know I, I was fully expecting it to work when I do it. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Amber alert. Missing color in the area. <laughs> <laughs> and those mox ambers. <laughs> All right. Well, this episode's gone pretty long, so let's wrap things up with this last deck here, Lotus Breach Storm. Uh, I've seen a couple versions of this deck. Uh, I've seen Teamer versions. Uh, I've seen straight Izzet versions. The version we're looking at right now is a straight Izzet version with uh, Baral, Goblin, Electromancer. And essentially, you're just assembling the combo of Underworld Breach in play chronic flooding on your land and then hidden strings and you yeah. just that goes infinite allows you to mill your whole deck and then you cast a Thassa's oracle and win and these decks these decks while scary i still think they're pretty untuned and not very good but uh, i was so just to like the list that we're looking at right now like it's the similar to like the some of the list that happened like right when the, the thing came out and i just like I don't think in the entire, uh, I guess like in the sideboard you have Fave Wishes, but in the entire main deck at least, you can't actually ever beat in a million years a uh, Disallow on the fastest Oracle. <laughs> well, yeah, luckily no one plays that card though. <laughs> like if I was playing Blue White at this Pro Tour and like, and you know, I would just 100% just have like one of Troll, you know, Disallow just because like if you draw it, you never actually lose the storm in a million years. Like you can just like not tap three mana for the rest of the game and they can't kill you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this version here has like a one of fave wishes that I guess can go get like a Jace in the sideboard, but no phase main. So mm-hmm. it is yeah, pretty all main in. deck, you're totally dead. <laughs> I guess people were just excited to make breach work. It, again, it feels like uh a less like less work has been put into it is something like inverter of truth combo, which hasn't had that much work at all. But maybe there's something here that's worthwhile. Um, maybe it turns out that this is harder to interact with for the format than Inverter of Truth, and this is a combo that sticks around, but who knows? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the deck doesn't actually look all that different than when it was just playing, like, digs and stuff. I don't know. They kind of just, like, jam for Underworld Breach in there and I think kind of just called it a day. Like, Yeah, I mean, do you really need to do anything else? It's free flashback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's yeah yogmod's will confirmed pretty good magic card but uh what i'm learning here from looking at this deck list that i didn't know before is that there's a magic card named chronic flooding and i kind of want to buy a bunch and just give them to opponents that complain <laughs> <laughs> Dude, oh that's yeah. actually yes yeah, sweet so for the, like the next time you're on like moto and you're like you, you got to name something with like uh pithing needle that's my you know you naming chronic flooding uh, chronic flooding if that's the, why they're losing you know what i mean and it's like irrelevant. it's like before my troll name was always abandoned hope because just it's it's you know yeah that's a good one it's right at the top of the list it's alphabetical it's just right there you know it's a good one right it's classic but yeah you know, chronic flooding it just i ran into this problem the next dimension on arena my DM. i was playing a tamio <laughs> deck and i needed i wanted to plus tamio but i didn't want to take any of the cards i wanted them all in my graveyard so that i had enough to escape a pelucranos I know I had this problem. I didn't know off the top of my head like what the best card name was. I named just Teferi because it wasn't in my deck and therefore like I missed. But what's the best name on Arena to whiff? Oh, that's a good question. I'd have to yeah. gather a search that. That's true. Yeah. Which is like probably the most pathetic gather a search of all time. <laughs> Actually, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
Yeah, I'm sure there would have been worse. But <laughs> just as like a really quick, um, there was I heard uh, from Tom Ross over Twitter. Uh, one of the things he did this weekend was he in like the limited, just naming cards that like aren't actually in your deck. Was there were a couple of times he said he was dead on board, but he had the prophecy, and the trigger happened, and so he named cards that could exist that weren't actually being played. Oh, yeah. So like that six mana bounce three. He just like named it, right? And then he said, like, you know, they play around it. Yeah. Yeah. And then yeah, I I saw this tweet as well. He would name like the five mana flash blue legend, the rare Thrix or whatever. Or he'd name, you know, Sea God Scorn. So Uh, his opponent would think he had it the next game and would play around it. And well, but he has a big brain. (laughs) Yeah. uh, (laughs) None of our brains. We have talked about this. None of our brains are that big on this podcast. No. But. That's uh well one more thing talking about big brain people especially from New Jersey one of the things we didn't do I think was uh, give a shout out to Josh. Oh yeah, you know Ottawa player Josh took down one of the limited PTQs this weekend. He's in a New Toronto Jersey. player now. Toronto? No, he's always going to uh, be an well, Ottawa player. My God. Well, he lives in Hamilton, so definitely not Toronto. But uh, yeah, <laughs> Josh Malloy, um, he was working really hard with us, like just as much uh, as me, or you know probably even more on the Kepa test. Um, He's actually like one of the most insane players. He's lost like so many Pro Tour winning ins. It's actually insane. And his like MTG like Elo project. He's up at like 2K now, but this is like his first Pro Tour. It's pretty wild. Jeez. Kind of a long time coming. Yeah. You and, know, uh, back when we, there used to be PPTQs, I lost in the finals of quite a few of them. And he was one of the person that beat me, <laughs> beat me in a PTQ final. Yep. Yeah. He's an absolute sicko. So love to see him queuing. Mm hmm. Uh, also love to see it forcing mono white and draft in the top eight of his sealed PTQ because we told him it was good. Oh yeah, yeah. And, he uh, uh, he said he was gonna. <laughs> he was still in the Swiss of the event, but it was doing really well. And he told us in our chat that if he top eighted, he was gonna force red white for science. And he forced red white for science and just smashed everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Because uh, yes, yeah, so, like basically all my limited pro like. Uh, uh, Testing has been, like, I've done like a bunch of drafts. Like, I've done like probably like 15 to 20, somewhere in that range. But I've also just been like watching a lot of limited and trying to like think more about the format rather than actually play it because I've been a little strapped for time recently. Mm-hmm. And one of the guys I watch is that uh, Chester Rose, right? The ham TV guy. Yeah. yeah he's I've, like I've actually that guy. Complete beast. He's insane. So that guy, he, he had the Moto Trophy lead and then he also had number one spot in Mythic and Limited simultaneously at the same time. Oh, yeah. I remember seeing that. <laughs> It's absurd. Yeah. Having one of those achievements is like, makes like the magic career for, you know, like most people, right? Like that's mm-hmm. like, I had like the number one spot ranked in, in the, you know, the limited on arena, or I had like the Moda trophy lead for, for trophies. Cause that's quite competitive too. Right. But like, well, first off, this guy should probably just be in the hall of fame. Cause he was like nuts. At like magic's on set. <laughs> and then just kind of like, stop playing. but like, yeah, he's, he's yeah. absurd. And like, he's so good at the limited format. He basically just said like, nobody's taking these like, you know, white aggressive cards and i'm just like pounding everybody with them so josh and i both saw that when he was like all right well you know he should probably just force that deck if you top eight and then yeah he did and, you know mm-hmm. just like the rest of history just like smash people yeah. trying to play like stupid green black cards you know what i mean yeah paid off thank <laughs> you the ham tv yeah <laughs> yeah so shout out to that guy yeah all right well let's wrap this thing up thanks matt for joining the show again it was great to have you on i think it was a really good deep dive in a pioneer that was, that was a lot of fun to talk about i learned a lot Absolutely. all right well, you're ready to tackle your next local Pioneer event, maybe yeah. at the Wizards Tower. Great sponsor of this podcast here in Ottawa, wizardtower.com. Check them out for all your Magic single needs. Lots of great events they're holding here in Ottawa. Pioneer Standard, uh, they've got their WPNQ preliminaries coming up within the next couple of months, so be on the lookout for that. Thank you for joining the club this week. However you listen to the show, whether it's Podbean, iTunes, any podcast app, leave a review, rate the podcast, share it with your friends. Everything helps, keeps the thing growing, breaking to listeners. Anything else to say, guys, before we sign off? Uh, I mean, probably, but we've been going on for quite a while. So <laughs> I think just probably cut it there is best. We'll, yeah, I don't know. we'll wrap it up. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Well, I, I mean, can be. Yeah. <laughs> I, I got nothing to add. <laughs> all right. Thanks for listening, everybody. We'll catch you all next week. <laughs> <laughs>